welcome to everybody and welcome back to some of you as well. Just thinking there might be another black lab coming next Sunday. The, uh, the puppy might make a, a visit. That's going to make sure you come, isn't it? <laughs> Little black Labrador puppy Julian that might come next week. A couple of notices. Um, this Advent we're going to be again putting on a film each Wednesday of Advent. Uh, Christmas film. So please, this is the third year we've done it, so I'm kind of running out of films. And um, so make suggestions to me. Can't guarantee it will be that one, but it might be. And then next Sunday, we continue our series, uh, Breathing Underwater, our preaching series based on the 12 steps. Uh, But also during the first part of the service, we are going to have communion. And communion um, leading up to an act of remembrance. And for sure, as you and I both know, uh, at this time we need to be thinking about peace and the victims of war. So during the first part of the service we'll be doing that and then stopping for a silence at 11 o'clock to remember all the victims of past and the victims presently from the horrors of war. I'm going to read from Psalm 19 verse 12. But who can detect their errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Very poignant for our series again. Who can detect their errors? Who sees everything? And who can clear me from hidden faults? My Jesus, my Saviour. I invite you to stand if you're able.
please have a seat. Who watched Friends in the 80s and 90s? Who had a crush on Chandler? <laughs> really tragic news uh, last week, wasn't it, that Matthew Perry um, died. He'd been learning quite a lot about him and didn't know some of this. Apparently as a teenager, this was his prayer. God, you can do anything you want with me, but make me famous. When he was about 14 or 15. Um, personally, I don't think God answered that prayer in the way we might think God answered that prayer. But um, there was a step of faith, wasn't there? And tempted to say, be careful what we pray for, but God isn't like that, but you know what I mean. Apparently that first few episodes, every episode... Each member of the cast, the main characters, earned £22,000 each per episode. But then when it took off, each of the members earned a million dollars per episode. And even up until this year, and ongoing actually from his estate, um, personally just Matthew Perry was earning $20 million a year from the rights and uh, the, the brand from Friends. But behind all that, I've learnt about his shyness, his shyness as a child. Something familiar, actually, that's come up, hasn't it, over the 12-step series. People who we've interviewed have mentioned shyness and something a bit hidden that many of us wouldn't suspect sometimes. Um, anxiety, really struggled with anxiety. And, of course, addiction, which started after... He was on the water and fell off the, I'm trying to think of the name of it, what are they called? Jet ski, that's the one. Um, and injured himself and then had to have painkillers and got addicted to painkillers and then went on to other addictions, different kinds of drugs and alcohol. And really tragic. I love some of the quotes that he made as well. I've been reading up some of the quotes. The thing I'm most proud of in my life he said, if a stranger came up to me and said, I can't stop drinking, I can't stop drinking, can you help me? I can say yes. And he used a lot of his fortune, but perhaps more importantly, a lot of his time. Anybody who came up to him and asked for help who was an addict, he would help them. And then he also said, this is the one that's been in the press more recently, when I die, I'd like friends to be listed behind helping people. And then some of the words we've heard from time to time during this series, he said, my favourite six words in recovery are, trust God, clean house, and help others. I've been really touched. I, I think I've learned so much and um, Changed in some ways during this series, and that's in preparing it, listening to some of you preach and visitors preach, listening to people's stories during interviews and praying about it um, deeply in many ways. And I've asked a few people to say something this morning. They already know, so I'm not going to put anybody on the spot, but to say personally, not, not just up here, but personally, what has struck you during this series? What has changed you? What has moved you during the series? So I'm going to invite, first of all, Joyce to come up and join me. Yeah, that's sure. Encouragement. And thanks. Just a reminder to all of you, when I ask you if you'd like to do a reading, if you'd like to do something, uh, I'll come up here, because it's quite scary. I always say, feel free to say no, and that is genuine. And some people said no, which is I fine. He put, he put my arm up. I did, I did twist Joyce's arm up. <laughs> what touch do you do this? Well... When I first heard that we were going to do the 12 steps, I hadn't got a clue what it was. And I don't know how many other people did. But I was interested when they first started. On the first week, I think, um, I think it was Anne who did the first interview. And it was so touching. And I thought, there's something in this. These people have been to hell and back. And then there were other people that in, were interviewed and they all came up with this terrible story of where they'd been and how different, different reasons they'd got there. But in all of that, somebody was always there to help them. 
in their lowest time. And I thought that was wonderful. And then when they gradually came back and climbed that hill again, they found God, a faith. Whether they'd had it before or not, I just don't know. But I, I just felt in my heart of hearts, what a wonderful thing. These people have come back through all of this. And I think I've learned through that. I mustn't be so jud judgmental of people. I think we all are quite late, but I just thought it was a wonderful thing that these people who have been speaking, doing sermons, not professional people, but all speaking about the 12 steps. And I can't wait to hear the rest. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And Paul, Paul's kindly agreed to come forward as well. So the same question for you, Paul. Thank you. Um, I think <clears throat> Mike knows, because I've told him throughout the series, I struggled with the book. Um, I don't think I'm stupid, but the style of writing, the structure, um, I've just found really hard to follow, even in small chunks, chapters. Um, so one of the things I've done on the inside cover of the book is each week I've just put um, what makes sense to me. Um, so for including this week, um, my ten sentences. I can't. God can. Let God. What's the root? Like the root of the problem here. Restore relationships with God and with others. Brackets, forgive. Paradox. Work at it, take responsibility. Don't work at it. God's plan, stroke, grace. We don't have to ask God for help, but it's good for our relationship if we do. List those we've harmed and make amends. Pause and think whether it will help the other person. And this week for me, having read the chapter, uh, work on your self-awareness, but be gentle. Um, and then there's a couple of other words which for me um, sum up, I guess, the themes. Um, theme of the book, um, balance, and what it's, I suppose, what a more personal aspect is, is um, resentfulness which I can tell you about. If. <laughs> um, for balance, um, I think that, that's a word that's cropped up in different ways during the series. Duality, paradox, balance. And there was a lovely phrase early on in the series which was about feeling the tension, this sort of sweet spot that there is sometimes. So um, one thing that Emma touched on last week is about the importance of looking back, but it is actually about moving forward, you know, not beating ourselves up. It's about ego, examining ourselves, but actually it's more importantly, it's about other people. Um, it's about taking responsibility, but again, there's a, a line to be struck. At what some point you just accept God's grace. And the resentfulness, uh, this is a personal thing. Um, we've discussed this, Mike. Um, I thought I had a problem with, um, with forgiveness, and I think it's, um, it was when Alan came. Um, I realised that my problem was more to do with um, resentfulness. Um, and that's stopping me, has been stopping me be a, a better version of myself, again using Emma's words from last week, um, having a better relationship with others and with God. Um, and also it's been stopping other people from moving on, uh, whether these are people that have harmed me or I have harmed them. And my list, um, those people, um, they come in both categories, actually. Thank you very much. Thank you for your honesty. <laughs> and Philly's going to come and say a few words. Yeah, that's show. Well, I shall be very brief because all of what's just been said is just what I feel too. Um, one thing that um, sort of helped me very much was our whole life group, where we discussed what was said before, and I found this extremely helpful because we all sort of thought the same thing, or we don't understand a bit, uh, at it, or, or we um, struggle with it, or, but to talk together 
helped a lot. And I think that was the same in AA. People talk together about what they're going through. And um, I think it's very important that we share sometimes what we struggle with, not to keep it all to yourself. And uh, I found that obviously um, church and, and our whole life group and God, I mean, we just you know, have to say, well, I struggle, but here I am, Lord, and uh, will you help me? And uh, God is faithful, and I think that came through very much. So, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Great is thy faithfulness. mind actually um, that a young mum said last Sunday remember how for those of us who were here um, how the rains the heavens poured last Sunday as we were locking up and a young mum turned up at the door and her car had broken down in that and 
somebody came out from within this church, I won't mention names to embarrass people, but somebody came out back in with their jump leads and basically, uh, while they didn't work actually, but helped to get her to the garage. And she was, was um, tears in her eyes and she was saying words to this effect. So it was a beautiful moment. We're going to, every week we have been reading Breathing Underwater, the poem that's in the book. And I can read it, but if somebody who hasn't read it so far would like to read it, um, I, I can come to you with the microphone, or you could come up here and read it, whichever you prefer, actually. So just pop your hand up if you'd like to read it. And I've got the words, and they're big. I built my house by the sea, not on the sands, mind you, not on the shifting sand, and I built it of rock, a strong house by a strong sea, and we got well acquainted, the sea and I, good neighbours, not that we spoke much, we met in silences, respectful, keeping our distance, but looking our thoughts across the fence of sand, always the fence of sand, our barrier, always the sand between. And then one day, and I still don't know how it happened, the sea came without warning, without welcome even, not sudden and swift, but a shifting across the sand like wine, less like the flow of water than the flow of blood, slow but coming, slow but flowing like an open wound. And I thought of flight, and I thought of drowning, and I thought of death. And while I thought, the sea crept higher till it reached my door. And I knew then that there was neither flight, nor death, nor drowning, that when the sea comes calling, you stop being neighbours, well acquainted, friendly at a distance neighbours, and you give your house for a coral castle, and you learn to breathe underwater. Thank you. Lovely encouragement today from the front, isn't it? <laughs> um, we, we haven't commented um, on, on this. We've kind of like let it speak in different ways through different voices. Uh, but Anne's going to go around with the microphone. And if you want to say what's jumped out to you over the week, just in, just in one sentence perhaps, or two sentences, um, pop your hand up, because I know, you know, it speaks in different ways, so there's not a right way, there's not a right way. Um, has it spoken to you? Pop your hand up if you don't mind just saying where you're seated and that will come to you. Or if you've been totally confused by it, you can say that as well. I've been very struck by the whole idea of breathing on water and the fact that in church, testimony is usually about being saved from the water, and being above the water and everything being okay, when life actually is often about the water that doesn't part, and the water is, that is above your head. And I still don't fully understand what the poem means, but um, that speaks to me. I absolutely love that. Love that. Thank you. Anybody else like to say? I think building on that point that it's okay to be vulnerable, and when you are, there's other people just like you, and other people there to support you. Wonderful. Thank you. And then Lee, I think, wanted to. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe one more, if anybody, there is one more. Tony. Um, I'm reading war books at the moment, and uh, uh, the world is uh, surrounded by two thirds by water, I think, something like that. And, uh, when, uh, when nations do battle together on the seas, the sea is neutral. The sea is not responsible for anything that's going on. And, uh, um, many things I think God himself 
Thank you, Tony. Which is often the deep seat of prayer. Thank you. And that's a good prompt to pray, actually. Let's, let's um, have a moment of prayer. And during this, uh, we're going to stop and, and think about your offering. Um, and yes, it covers um, your, your generous gifts to the church financially. It, it, it covers your gifts in every way, um, however you give, both to this church, through this church, and in your daily lives. Uh, in the silence, you might like to recommit to whatever you want to give for God's building his kingdom in and through us. So let's have a moment of silence and think about that. offer this as it just came to mind and as well as your offering a question I ask myself and I ask each of you is are you also open to receive from God and from others Lord, we continue to feel very small in many ways when we see the needs in our local community and when we see and witness the struggles of loved ones in our families and friendship groups and neighbours. And further afield, Lord, when we see the vulnerability of individuals, the danger that many individuals are in, and the fear amongst many, and all the mishmash that that causes and leads to. Lord, when this world seems to be overwhelmed by the oceans, by the seas, we pray that you help us to, as people, learn to breathe underwater and recognise the humanity in all. Thank you for that beautiful reminder, Jesus, that when we love our enemies, in effect we no longer have enemies. We recognise how easy it is to say words like that and to believe that. But by your spirit, we pray that you help us to learn to live that in our daily lives and that it becomes contagious in this world. For we ask this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. And to ask Lee to come forward and to read our two short readings for today. Romans 2 verses 14 to 15. When Gentiles who do not possess the law do instinctively what the law requires, these, though not having the law, are a law to themselves. They show that what the law requires is written on their hearts, to which their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts will accuse or perhaps excuse them. John 21 17. Jesus spoke to him a third time. He asked, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt bad because Jesus asked him a third time, Do you love me? He answered, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Title for this morning, based on step 10, continue to take personal inventory. Inventory. And when we were wrong, promptly, promptly admitted it. 
Is this overkill? Is this overkill? Richard Raw, the author of the book, says, I must admit, when I first read step 10, I wanted to say, oh, come on now, let's get on with something a bit more positive. This is beginning to feel like endless examination of conscience and will keep people navel-gazing forever. But, as Richard Raw goes on to say, this maintenance stage, and Alan, the sponsor who preached a while ago and who I spoke with to understand the 12 steps more, said the importance of this maintenance step. It's absolutely essential. And in no way, this is important, is it shame or guilt-based. Unlike, it has to be said, much of the teaching in churches over the years, throughout history, and probably sadly today as well. It's actually good news. It's about the vision of what healthier living can look like for all of us, for each of us. Step 10, this step is freeing, inspiring, motivating, hope-giving, and it is totally different to, again, what some of us might be more used to, fear-based scrupulosity. Bill W, probably a word we used to use more as well, so Bill W, who was a co-founder of AA, said it's not about negative threats or fear-based problem solving. It's positive. I know what Paul was saying about Richard Raw's writing, and I know what he was saying about this book as well. There is so much wisdom, though, in this chapter, although at first, as with Richard Raw's writing, it takes so much pondering, I find, anyway, until the light goes on and I kind of get what he's getting at sometimes. During my pondering this week, I felt very playful. I felt very playful. With so much about AI in the news at the moment, artificial intelligence, there was the AI Safety Summit held at Bletchley Park this week, and there's another conference next week, and they're looking at things like, this is quite scary, I heard in the news this morning, artificial intelligence is being used to design new medicines. Fantastic, exciting, breakthroughs are coming. But also, are there going to be limits on it being able to design poisons that can be used more effectively in this world as well? So really big things like that. Uh, children using artificial intelligence to write essays. Ministers using artificial intelligence to write sermons. <laughs> but with my playfulness, I wondered what chat GPT, artificial intelligence, would make of step 10. And how it overlaps with the teachings and the way of Jesus. And for those of you who don't know, chat GP is a computer-based program powered by artificial intelligence. It's like having a conversation with a computer that can provide information and answer questions, and you can do it on your phone as well. How clever is that? So, I asked Chat GPT, what can Christians learn from step 10? The first thing it came up with, continual self-examination, and went on to say, step 10, I'm not going to do a computer voice, encourages individuals to regularly take inventory of their thoughts, actions, and attitudes. For Christians, this practice is reminiscent of the biblical teaching, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith, from 2 Corinthians. It's an opportunity to assess their relationship with God, ensuring they are walking in accordance with their faith. Computer has told us this morning, hasn't it? But do we do that? Do we have continual self-examination? I would suggest again within churches over the years, it's not always, maybe not often, something that we do. Different ways of doing this. There can be set times of this self-examination. I found it really helpful during my sabbatical when my spiritual director gave me the words of a, a Jesuit practice that you do towards the end of the day. And it was these words to reflect on the day. Lord, you know me better than I know myself. Your spirit pervades every moment of my life. Thank you for the grace and love you shower on me. Thank you for your constant, gentle invitation to let you into my life. Forgive me for the times I have refused that invitation and closed myself off from you. Help me in the day to come to recognise your presence in my life 
to open myself to you, to let you work in me, to your greater glory. Amen. And then the encouragement is to pause and stop and think where I wasn't open, where I was open. And then to pray for the next day that actually, can I build on that? Can you build on that? So there's those set times during the day perhaps. But more importantly, in many ways, it's that self-examination as a way of life. Richard Raw, I love this difference, he says, between conscience which can be quite loaded and quite negative, and consciousness, learning consciousness. Consciousness is a wise teacher. And consciousness is learning to be more aware in the moment. Noticing, I love this, noticing ourselves, noticing. We aren't our emotions, we aren't our thoughts, but there's something within each of us that can learn to notice those emotions, notice those thoughts, notice motivations as opposed to and the suggestion of many these days are recognizing actually ancient wisdom is that most of us sleepwalk through life most of us sleepwalk through life most of us do that and the trouble is rather than responding to the environment and circumstances in life we end up reacting almost as though puppets not in control of our lives by having consciousness we're less likely to cause harm to ourselves and to other people. And with consciousness, when we are aware, we recognise when we have caused harm, big, little, and we can promptly admit it. This is the work of the Holy Spirit within, reminiscent of what we hear in Romans, that this knowing, this knowing is written on our hearts. It's becoming in touch with that knowings. Part of the wonder and beauty that I learnt on the Enneagram training I did a few years ago, which I hadn't learned before, was developing this inner observer. It was groundbreaking for me, gentle but groundbreaking. Starting to notice more what's going on and then having more choice about what to do with that. Liz West, who was one of my teachers a few years ago, said, and she is an ex-minister, she's, what am I saying, in her 70s, and she's been doing this stuff for a long time. And she said that she recognises the stuff going on, and the same old personality traits come out within her that she had 30, 40, 50 years ago. But these days she's quicker to recognise quicker to respond rather than react. And when she has reacted out of place, quicker to notice that and make amends. It can be transforming. In prison, in anger management groups, I remember hearing this so much, it just happened. It just happened. And part of the learning for people with anger management problems is it never just happens. There's this A, B, C. They think A, the antecedent, what actually goes on before, the behaviour, the B, and then the consequence. It just happens like that. But no, when that A happens, it's learning to pause and recognise. I can see some of you nodding. It's not just automatic. We have choice. Feeling angry because that person ignored us. That friend walked across the other side of the road. Getting angry, maybe responding, sending them a nasty text. Ah, no, actually, pause, think, maybe they didn't see me. Oh, that touched a nerve as well. <laughs> so, recognising this stuff going on inside of us. How about you? What kind of awareness do you have of this stuff? What kind of self-control? Secondly, thank you, chat GPT. You came up with repentance and confession, going on to say... Just as step 10 involves admitting wrongs promptly, Christians can apply the concept of confessing sins to God promptly. In Christianity, repentance and seeking forgiveness are essential for maintaining a close relationship with God and addressing wrongdoing. Yeah. And no. I don't think in any relationship it is good to keep on saying sorry, 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 sorry. I don't think it is healthy to be like that with God. 
We're forgiven. We're forgiven. I wonder, find out one day, won't we? But I wonder in God's grace is keeping a short account with God, saying sorry when we do say sorry. It's actually for our sake. It's not for God's ego, that's for sure. It's not because God is easily offended. I remember hearing that teaching with quite a famous preacher in the church around here saying, oh, God flies off when you... No, 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 God's not easily offended. God is bigger than that. Confession is healthy, bringing things into the light. Repentance is change of thinking, is change of direction, getting rid of this stinking thinking and being transformed by the renewing of our minds. And of course, repentance and confession towards others is at the heart of step 10. Thirdly, the computer told me, make amends. Step 10 reminds individuals to make amends when necessary. In the Christian faith, ChatGP went on to say, this aligns with the principles of reconciliation and seeking forgiveness from those they may have wronged. Yes and no. Over the last two weeks we've been looking at when it comes to making amends, when it comes to saying sorry, such wisdom is needed and especially not doing it, not rushing when it's going to cause harm to somebody else. And reconciliation, seeking reconciliation can sometimes be beautiful, wonderful and healing, but sometimes it's not wise, it can cause more troubles. Seeking forgiveness. I really want to be forgiven by you. I really want to be... <sighs> comes again about us again. Or it can come about us again. The fourth was gratitude. Step 10 includes expressing gratitude for progress made. Christians can incorporate this by regularly thanking God for his blessings, guidance and transformative work he is doing in their lives. And I do think that's really good. I think it's so good for us. And that's partly what we're doing this morning when I ask people up and in groups. What awareness do you have about, okay, where we fall short, but what about the progress that you have made? Where have you grown? And of course there is a danger, because it is God working within us, that pride can come in. But again, just being aware of where that can turn into pride. Fifthly, daily prayer and meditation. Daily prayer and meditation. Step 10 encourages daily prayer and meditation. For Christians, this practice aligns with their faith's emphasis on daily communion with God through prayer and meditation on Scripture. And thankfully, Peter is going to be talking about that next week. Personal responsibility. What do you like with personal responsibility? Well, this is what the computer has to say to you and me. Step 10 reinforces the idea of taking personal responsibility for one's actions and behaviour. Christians can relate to this biblical te through biblical teachings about personal accountability. I remember my girlfriend, who I had to apologise to, remember, if you were here, but I remember when we first started going out and I was decorating her mother's house to get some extra cash, and beautiful, very house proud, brought a beautiful new carpet, and Vicky's young brother came in, he was much younger, and he kicked the paint over and then ran out the room, and mother appeared, and said, what's happened here? And he said, it wasn't me, it was Mike. Yeah. But all his footsteps in paint were leading out the room, so... Accepting personal responsibility can be so, so hard. What are you like? What am I like with that? In prison, this is genuine. Working four years in prison, for my first year, it was hard to find somebody who admitted they're guilty. <laughs> there was often somebody else's fault or some kind of justification of what they did. But again, that's pointing out there. What about you and me? Justification, explaining away why we've done something. Denial, not accepting what we've done. Or blaming somebody else. Sometimes we blame God. If only my circumstances were different. I love it. Christians do this, thinking it sounds very spiritual. They often blame the devil. Have you noticed that? 
Good news for you. The devil cannot make you do anything. God cannot make you do anything, so why would God allow the devil to? The other thing that you often hear in life, do you hear this? Do you say this? You make me feel. You made me feel. Guess what? Here in counselling as well, they made me feel. Nobody, 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 nobody can make you or me feel anything. It's about how we respond. That's good news. Because that gives more control, more responsibility. We can do something about that. It's freeing. Seventh, preventing resentments and negative emotions. Step 10, encourages addressing negative emotions properly to prevent resentment from taking hold. In Christianity, letting go of anger and practicing forgiveness aligns with Jesus' teachings about forgiveness and loving one's enemies. I think in this, I'm talking personally, noticing is so key because we can become accustomed not to her face, not to her smile, those of you who know Big Maiden, my fair lady, but we can become accustomed to resentment, lack of forgiveness, and we think that's just how it is, but it's not. It doesn't have to be. I love this wise teaching, apparently in American, Native American teaching. A grandparent and a grandchild are talking and looking, and there are two wolves having a fight. And the grandchild says to the grandparent, which one will win? And the grandparent says, the one I feed. The same within us. What's going to win? Resentment, anger, bitterness? Or the opposite? Eighth. Continual growth and spiritual progress. Step ten emphasises ongoing personal growth. Similarly, Christians can view their faith journey as a continual process of spiritual growth and sanctification with the goal of becoming more Christ-like. There we go. The computer says it, and that is it. Again, and I think, and I find this freeing to think this, I don't have a critical spirit in saying this, and I could be wrong, but I think Christianity has become so much more about having the right beliefs. You're a proper Christian if you think this, that, and the other. I love this I saw the other day, I shared with some of you. Jesus, why am I the only one in heaven with you? Everyone else's theology was slightly off. And I love you, those of you who recognise the resemblance between me and that little boy. That might be my pride. About right beliefs. Important, but what about how we live? How about you during this series? Again, are you letting the Spirit of God transform how you live, how you are? And then finally, living in the present. Step 10, the computer says, encourages individuals to stay present and mindful of their actions. Christians can apply this by, I'm laughing now, because I just, I'm going to stop that. I just, I remember, because um, I love mindfulness and all this kind of thing, and I thought I would treat Kate and Hannah, Sophie and George to a mindfulness day. And um, it was just hilarious how that went down. People falling asleep during the mindfulness day that costs a lot of money. It's hard mindfulness, but actually it can be crucial. To set 10 encourages individuals to stay present and mindful of their actions. Christians can apply this by focusing on living in the present moment, trusting in God's guidance for the future, and avoiding worry about things beyond their control, including changing the past, I guess. Somebody said this to me once, and I think it's so profound. I didn't get it at first, but I love it. The only thing that exists is the present. It's obvious, isn't it? All the things we think about, but they don't exist anymore. All those things about the future, they don't exist. 
The only thing that exists is the now. Learning to trust God, and it is learning, isn't it? That God will give us grace when those challenges come in the future. And I don't know if you've learned this, I've learned this, that the grace doesn't come before you need it. It comes in the moment. There is one caveat in all of this about not looking too much at the past. And you know I'm a great believer of something called the presenting past. That very often what's gone in in our past, our childhood, our teens, our ad early adulthood, just keeps coming back in the game. We keep repeating stuff, keep repeating stuff. And unless we address it, it will keep again pulling all our strings and it will look like we've got no control over it. But actually, once we allow God to bring it into the light, sometimes that can bring release. I love it in that couples counselling programme. Again, where the couple, the relationship problems have been going on and he's blaming her, she's blaming him, or her, she's blaming her and he's blaming him. And suddenly they make the connection, oh, I was like that with my mother. My mother was like that with me, or my father. And it's almost like the relief comes because the light goes on and the healing can come. And being set free from that kind of spiral. Portia Nelson wrote a beautiful poem, and I'm going to read it towards this close. There's a hole in my sidewalk. I'm going to change it to pavement. I walk down the street, there's a deep hole in the path, I fall in, I'm lost, I'm helpless, it isn't my fault, it takes forever to find a way out. I walk down the same street, there's a deep hole in the pavement, I pretend I don't see it. I fall in again. I can't believe I'm in the same place. But it isn't my fault. It still takes me a long time to get out. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the pavement. I see it there. I still fall in. It's a habit. My eyes are open. I know where I am. It is my fault. I get out immediately. I walk down the same street. There is a deep hole in the pavement. I walk around it. I walk down another street. Let me draw this together. Well, thank you, ChatGPT. My nephew, who's into coding, when I told him that I was going to be basing a sermon on this, he said, that's very dystopian. <laughs> With Elon Musk, who spoke at this conference, he said, many of us, if not all of us, will be out of jobs one day because of artificial intelligence. I wonder if it will replace me in the near future. The only thing is, with ChatGPT, it's knowledge based, it's about information being input. It can be creative within that. But I wonder, I wonder about the limitations. But I do think, this is a final thought, that as Christians we can be just like that. I can be just like that. It sometimes becomes about input, knowledge based information, the right things to believe, with very little personal transformation. Or, do we choose this day to learn from those who we have heard benefiting from this 12-step program and in humility lap up the good news that we're hearing over this series? Let us pray. Dear Lord, pray for all of us actually that you help us be creative in every walk of life and think out of the box maybe, especially if we get trapped inside a box and a set way of thinking. Lord, we pray together that where there has been good news this morning, in what we've heard from people speaking from the front, from what we've heard over the last 25 minutes or so, that we recognise that good news is from you, and that we learn to trust you more and more. In the moment, with the past 
and as we look ahead to the future. We ask all this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. And I invite you to stand if you're able for our closing song. Please stay for coffee if you would like to and you're able. I'm going to say the serenity prayer together and then I'm going to invite Gillian to close that with saying Amen. So I'll come to Gillian if that's okay. And then you can close the prayer with Amen. 
So God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference, living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardships as the pathway to peace, taking as he did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will. Come forward for anointing, simple anointing, and you're not. Know